and welcome to Belmont Journal, Belmont's news show and community update. I'm your host, Shonul Malik. On Monday, November 29th at 8 a.m., the Select Board and the Board of Assessors are meeting jointly to assess the property tax rate for Belmont in the upcoming year. Public are encouraged to participate. You can find the Zoom link on the town's calendar website. This week is Transgender Awareness Week and Belmont's LGBTQ plus Alliance has put together an installation to remember all the transgender lives lost in the US this past year in US hate crime. Giving us more information is Joanna Zubelis. We're really excited here in Belmont because the town just agreed to make all of the month of November uh, in, to acknowledge the month of November as Transgender Awareness Month and within the month of November to have Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is honored nationally on the 20th um, to honor that here. And so the Alliance here in town uh, decided to create an installation on the town green right next to the church ground. And we've, we are in the process of creating uh, 43 sections of rope with little uh, signs honoring each of the people who have died in this country as a result of uh, transphobic violence this year. We have 43 people who were victims of transgender violence in the past year, and we're going to honor each one of those um, individuals. And so each one is going to get a six foot section of um, this installation, and it will have a a flag and then their picture and their biography and, and then a flag um, for each each of the individuals. And I think this kind of stuff is really important because like people in the community, like I'm sure most of the community just has no idea and um, it's really important to like educate people and I think not like saying anything and just letting people see and read things and go at their own pace is really important because then they can like sort of um, not relate to it, just like understand it more because they're, they're just like seeing the people and no one's talking about it, so it's not like a biased point of view, you know? So I just think it's like, and I think displaying it is like, uh, it's a form of art, which is also, I think is so powerful. So I just think like this was a, a really good way to get the message across, so I'm like really excited to be doing it. Oh, we could put a bench, Jeff. I'm really glad that they reached out um, to us for helping set this up. It's, it's pretty intense being here and looking at the all the images and descriptions of the people that were victims, transphobic violence. The Belmont Wellness Coalition results for its survey of assessing the risk behavior in youth are out and presented to the school committee. Lisa Gabriello, coordinator of the Wellness Coalition, gives more insight and advice to parents. Tell us about the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So this is a comprehensive survey that is administered every two years in Belmont, and it is administered to students in grades seven through 12. The YRBS asks a wide range of questions to our students, Mike, trying to gauge their overall well-being, their health, their questions on nutrition, screen time, experiences around mental health and bullying and questions about substance use. So it's a, it's a really comprehensive tool that has been around for about 30 years. Tell us what the data uh, uh, shows about substance use, use and attitudes among Belmont youth. So interestingly enough, Mike, we saw the numbers trend down when we compare the 2019 YRBS to the 2021 YRBS. So it appeared that our students were using less substances. However, the caveat to that piece of data, while good news, right, is also that the test was given last spring and the kids had just spent a full year from the pandemic. So it's hard to say if the test had been given um, without the global pandemic. 
um, what those numbers would have shown. The, the survey asked questions about their perception of risk and harm, meaning how dangerous do they think certain substances are? What we learned, Mike, which is fairly consistent in other years and across Massachusetts, is that students think that vaping and alcohol are more dangerous than they do think that marijuana is. So basically, marijuana is perceived as more harmless compared to the other two. And what we note from the survey is that as the kids get older, as they get into the higher grades, 10, 11, and 12, their overall perception of marijuana, of the risk of marijuana continues to decline. So they just, you know, continue to think it's not that dangerous. And we know that this likely reflects some of the changes that society has undergone the last several years with regard to legalizing marijuana, with regard to the fact that shops that sell recreational marijuana are popping up all over Massachusetts, and in fact, could pop up in the not too distant future in Belmont. A, a number of mental health questions were asked as part of the survey. What do the responses tell us about mental health? While I said the good news was that our substance use numbers looked like they trended down, the more concerning news was around mental health numbers. And it looked like the amount of stress and depression and some other factors trended up based on the survey. So we saw that students reported experiencing a lot of stress, the rates of depression, you know, definitely they were experiencing depression. And the thing that really caught our eye, Mike, was around the number of students considering suicide or having made a suicide plan or engaging in self-harm, these numbers seem to have ticked up. So what do we know about contributing factors? Well, we know that the pandemic was uh, definitely a contributing factor. There's been a lot of data collected around the pandemic's impact on mental health. The social isolation alone, we could call a contributing factor. But we also looked at multiple variants at the same time, and we know that students who are experiencing stress or bullying or spending an inordinate amount of time on social media, those students are vulnerable to feeling depressed. Belmont, I will add, is not alone in seeing the mental health numbers tick up a bit. We saw this across Massachusetts. And um, again, 2019 did show stress levels among our students, but it, were those it was those suicide numbers that ticked up since 2019. How about the kids who are most affected, Lisa? What do we know? Well, we do have some information on that. And we know that kids who identify as genderqueer and females showed higher numbers. And also with regard to self-harm and having made a suicide plan, we saw that kids who identify as multiracial showed higher numbers. Lisa, tell us what parents can do to provide more support for their kids. So basically I encourage parents to definitely check in with your kids around mental health, have conversations the same way that you would talk to your children if they had uh, a migraine, issues with chronic migraines or issues with other medical things, make mental health a priority as well. To not discuss mental health is to stigmatize it. So have conversations, ask how things are going at school. Ask specifically, is there anything that a parent, that I as your parent can do to support you? Keep an eye on the amount of sleep they're getting. Try to encourage a solid seven, eight, nine hours of sleep. I know that's really hard with teenagers, but try to encourage it. Keep an eye on their use of social media. Encourage them to take breaks. Model taking breaks yourself. Put your devices away. And if you think that their behavior has crossed over into more concerning, you know, they're, they're really withdrawn, they're, they're quitting things that they had enjoyed sports activities, they're not hanging out with friends the way they had, then really encourage professional help. It's difficult now. They're certainly harder to get those appointments, but it's not impossible. Contact your pediatrician to see if they have a list of providers. Contact the insurance company, your health insurance company, um, to see if they have a list of providers. So there are things that parents can do to show support to their kids. Joining us today is Franklin Tucker, editor of The Belmontonian. Franklin, welcome, and please shed some more light on this very concerning survey results. Yes, um, thank you for having me. I know that you had uh, Lisa Gabrello, who uh, was 
one of the authors of the, of the study, uh, of the survey, and uh, she reported that the, those very uh, concerning numbers, uh, upwards to uh, 9% of both middle school and high school students who actually plan um, a suicide, uh, a fifth of uh, middle school students have thought about it. And, uh, you know, and uh, marginalized uh, communities such as uh, queer gender um, have uh, uh, even higher rates, up to a third uh, of both planning and considering suicide. So those were issues that uh, really, really uh, uh, brought, uh, was brought to the attention of the school committee. And I think um, just hearing their response, they're, they're, they're more than just concerned. They, they made, they said that uh, these are um, issues that can't continue. You know, we, the, the community will have to move forward in terms of uh, um, taking um, a real action about this, and the school and the school district, uh, uh, through uh, Superintendent John Phelan, has stated that they are uh, going to be presenting uh, in the budget and uh, for the budget and soon uh, a, a complete plan on um, uh, you know anything from uh, c- continuing education for staff to to see uh, to identify students who are in trouble to uh, social workers to, to you know just assessments. And he said, now it's going to be up to the community. We're, and he said very distinctly, you know, the community is going to tell us whether they, they, they think this is important when he presents it uh, and uh, it goes before town meeting. Holidays are just around the corner. And along with the festive and the cheer, which is much anticipated, also comes loads of boxes. The Belmont town has organized yet another drop off day for the cart boats. Franklin, can you tell us more about it, please? <laughs> Well, it's one of the, it's it's almost like Christmas for a lot of homeowners when they can go down to the DPW yard and throw their uh, uh, cardboard boxes and drop them off. This year, it's going to be on the 18th of December. Uh, it is a week before Christmas. It's it's unusual that we have it before Christmas, and it's going to be five dollars. You can go to the uh, uh, I believe it's the rec department's um, uh, website. And, and you can register. It is five dollars. People were like saying, "Well, it was always free," uh, but you know they did it back in January of this year after Christmas, and they thought, "Oh, you know, we, we may not see as many uh, cars this year." It turned out that uh, you know over over three hundred and fifty cars lined the streets uh, to the DPW just because people have so much um, cardboard. It, it's one of those things where people are phoning already uh, last month uh, the town and saying, "When are we going to have a drop off?" And wow. so it's a, yeah. it's one of, it's, it's part of Christmas in Belmont. Mm-hmm. Would there be another drop off after the holidays to get rid of all the. There, there has been talk about that, but they haven't decided on a date. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Belmont has one more reason to be famous. Kira, Kira <laughs> Knightley, the Hollywood actress is coming to town for a movie shoot. It is exciting. Kira Knightley is coming to town. Uh, it'll be for one day, December 6th. Uh, it will be in the Windbrook area at, uh, on Stadler Road and in front of the Windbrook School. The Windbrook School is going to be transformed into a Boston Police uh, headquarters, which is pretty exciting. Uh, it is a movie about the Boston Strangler, and uh, Kira Knightley is one of the uh, two reporters who uh, first connected all the murders um, uh, that was happening uh, in Boston and on the North Shore to the Boston Strangler. Um, it was uh, it, it's it's one of those movies where it shows how, you know, it was always dismissed because it was women who were being murdered. And, and these women reporters were reporting on it, you know. So this is going to be a in- very interesting film. It's not going to be about the murder. It's going to be about, you know, determining who is the murderer. In our next segment, we have Joanna Zuvillis being interviewed by Fred Rigolo. Joanna is a multimedia journalist at the Belmont Citizen Herald and the Belmont Wicked Local. Thank you, Joanna, for being with us. So the first story that you are sharing with us today is a heartbreaking one. There is a new bench at Clipping Pound. Can you tell us more? Cleo Theodopoulos uh, was a member of Belmont High's class of 2020. And unfortunately, she uh, died during her junior year, one week after being diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, which is a fatal uh, cancer. And she suffered a fatal cancer induced stroke uh, at the age of 16. Um, It's been nearly three years, but Belmont hasn't forgotten Cleo. There's a banner that hangs on the fence at the entrance to Harris Field where she played field hockey. Um, And her family recently dedicated a bench at Clay Pit Pond to Cleo's friends. 
And the bench is engraved with a plaque that says, for Cleo's friends, thank you. And I met with her mother, um, Amanda, who said it really, uh, she just can't thank the friends and classmates of Cleo enough for all the outpouring of support they showed uh, during this difficult time. Um, so that's why they wanted to do this. And it's really a beautiful place where the bench is. It actually overlooks Belmont's new high school. And from the new high school cafeteria, you can actually see the bench across Clay Pit Pond, which I think is really special. Um, there is a fundraiser in memory of Cleo. It's um, actually uh, December 4th from 10 to two. And it's um, being held at the new skating club of Boston Norwood. Cleo used to skate, she was a figure skater and she um, belonged to the Skating Club of Boston. Proceeds from this fundraiser, which is sponsored by Denim Savings Bank. And um, it's also uh, the Scott Hamilton Cares Foundation, Mass General and Dana Farber Institute that are organizing this. Funds raised will benefit the Dana Farber Cancer Institute's Center for Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology. And that's where she was treated. Mm -hmm. And next story, um, the people, if you want some toys for the holiday season, you might want to start early this year. Right, Frederic. The pandemic has caused a major upheaval in the global supply chain, as you may have heard on the news. Um, so this has caused a delay in the shipping of things like toys. But the good news is Darren McGeehan, who owns the toy shop of Belmont, he ordered early, he got stock in for the holidays in August because he saw this coming, he said, yeah. and he expects this will be the same issue next year. He said, um, because the manufacturers in China shut down during COVID and 80% of his stock comes from China, that's that's part of the reason for the delay. But the, also, the, the, also, the other thing that's important to note is freight prices have gone up 40 to 50%. Um, and there's also a shortage of raw materials. So all this has caused prices to go up and he's tried to absorb as much of it as he can. So customers don't see it, but you'll probably see things that normally cost $14.99 that are now cost $19.99. And he also recommends having an A list and a B list for your children because it's possible you may not get exactly what they want. Okay, so so more than ever this year, shop wise, shop local. <laughs> And um, next story is Chenery has new a new roof, not right. a new roof, a new solar panel. On Pretty them. exciting, yes. Um, solar panels are being installed on the roof of the Chenery Middle School. It's the first municipal building in Belmont to get a solar array on its rooftop. There are 78 panels being installed. It'll produce an output of about 29.6 kilowatts, which will save the school about 6,000 a year in electricity costs. This is a project that's been long in the making. I don't know if anybody remembers back when we pushed residents to go solar. This was in 2016 and 2017. Direct Energy Solar said they would donate $28,000 to put a solar array on any of Belmont's buildings. Now it's not costing only 28,000, it's actually calling, costing 82,000, but the rest of the funds have been donated by Belmont Light, an anonymous citizen, and a grant from the Municipal Light Plant Association. So you'll see the project completed by December 1st. The Belmont Police Department is embarking on a strategic planning process, which will map out the direction for the department for the next five years. As part of this initiative, the first step is to solicit feedback from the Belmont residents. Joining us today is Chief James MacIsaac to shed more light on this survey. Welcome, Chief. I thank you and uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to, uh, to discuss this that, that we're doing here at the Belmont Police Department. Yes, welcome. Um, can you share with us um, what prompted the strategic planning process and, and why the need to solicit feedback through a survey? So when I was hired uh, back in 2020, uh, be before COVID, this was in my initial plan that I had talked about when I was being hired, hired was to conduct a SWOT analysis, which, which is strengths, mm -hmm. weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, uh, to do a citizen survey, an internal survey, and also have some uh, stakeholder meetings with uh, community stakeholders, and to develop a mission statement. 
And the idea behind this is obviously to make the department more efficient, to make it a uh, better serving department to the community, but also for, for us to develop a five-year strategic plan uh, to help guide the department moving forward. Because, you know, any organization, any, uh, you, know, you know, whether it's a dep small department or a big department, you need to have a plan. You just can't, um, you know, proceed day in and day out without a plan. And so because of COVID, that uh, kind of gets sidetracked. And so now we're back uh, on that, and, we're, and that's one of our major goals moving forward is to have that um, five-year strategic plan, hopefully um, in the early springtime uh, of next year. And, and if I may add, the, the survey, is citizen survey is anonymous. It is anonymous. Yes, it is. And you can find it at the Belmont Police Department website, which is belmontpd.org. Right on the main page, just to the left, there is a, a a block and it says uh, citizen survey. Mm -hmm. And it says on, on, on the police department's website that uh, residents, visitors, and those with a commercial interest in the town, is this someone, is this for potential business owners or current business owners? Whom are we looking at? You know, we want to hear from anybody who spends any amount of time in Belmont. You know, we have residents. So obviously some of the questions might be more geared for residents, but anybody who works in Belmont, Anybody who uh, you know visits Belmont on a regular basis, we want to hear from them. And the whole goal of, of this whole process is to take input. You know, we're not taking direction. The, the ultimate direction of the department will be determined will be determined by me. But we need to get input. We need to hear what people think about us. And just as I need to hear from the people, the employees at the department, I need to you know hear from them of what their expectations are and what they think we do well and what, what we think we need to work at to improve on. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe the survey is open through December 4th? Yes, it is. And once the results are in, how are you anticipating using those results and incorporating into what the direction for the department might be? So we're going to evaluate the results and then we'll make the results public so everybody okay. can, can see them. And then what uh, we plan to do is have uh, stakeholder meetings with the community, especially if there's things in there that we, you know, might need to address or we might want to hear more on. And, um, you know, you know, whether people want to come in and provide if, if there was actually somebody who filled out a survey and, and wants to come in and talk to us more about that. But mostly it's, you know, it's, it's the first step in engaging the community and giving them an opportunity to have input on what their police department Mm -hmm. um, you know, needs to improve on and also tell us what we do, what we do well. Um, has a similar survey or even a strategic planning process been done for the Belmont Police Department in the past? A survey was done back in, I'm going to, I'm going to guess, I'm going to look it up because I'll mention it when I do write, complete the survey. A survey was done in 2002, mm -hmm. I believe it was 2002 with the help of Brandeis University. Um, but that was the last time a survey was conducted. And that survey did not result in a uh, five-year strategic plan, or I'm not even sure it resulted in anything beyond uh, here's the survey, here's the results, and, and that was it. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're kind of seeing the same thing. We, we know what Belmont is. We'll, we'll hear that traffic is a major problem and, and those kinds of things. But things have changed a lot. Um, you know, over the last 20 years. So it, it'll be interesting to see um, what people's perceptions are of the police department. Belmont High School Auditorium is having its grand opening on December 2nd, featuring a concert by the Belmont High School Band and the Boston Brass. The event is being organized by Palms and Belmont High School Band Director, Alison Lacasse. Here is a story. This is my 16th year here in Belmont. And I remember first when I arrived here, as the band director at Belmont High School being just amazed at the quality of performances that our students were capable of. And it always broke my heart that we, they would be performing so beautifully on stage in an auditorium that didn't really honor the work that they were putting out. It's so gratifying to now be able to see students perform in a space that respects the work that they've done with their teachers and that really honors the level of performance that they'll be putting out. We're on the viewer side of the stage, and this was turned over in the last week, and it's ready and being used by the school department. The entire auditorium, that means the stage and all the functions, will be fully 
uh, available by Thanksgiving. They had all the functions that the performers uh, can expect in a high school setting. We have uh, fully functioning lighting and audio controls that are uh, equal to anything you'd find in a professional production. We have orchestra pit. We have a stage the same size as the old high school, which is a very large stage. We have a fly that's uh, high enough to take any scenery, lots of rigging opportunities. We have seating for 700, which is what they put in the old school. We have excellent acoustics, air conditioning, most comfortable seats. I expect the public in the school will be very pleased with the space. The last most important thing I think for performers and audience alike is that when you look around this space, it's a lot more intimate. About the same amount of seating, but it's brought closer to the performers and the, therefore the performers are closer to the audience and it's just going to be a much more wonderful space to see an event. So on December 2nd, we have our first live music performance indoors at Belmont High School since pre-COVID times. Uh, so that concert on December 2nd will feature the High School Symphonic Band and the High School Wind Ensemble. And we're also hosting the Boston Brass, who are probably one of the most renowned chamber music groups in the, in the world. It'll be, I think, a really wonderful community event to usher in this new, not just the new auditorium, but also sort of this hopefully post-COVID era of being able to do music again and being able to have live performances again. Uh, we will be relying on ticket sales, so, so hopefully folks in the community will come out to, uh, to hear the bands and to hear the Boston Brass and to help us celebrate the opening of our new auditorium. In community calendar news, if you're looking to catch up something new and exciting locally, Here's your chance to catch the play, The Servant of Two Masters, performed by the Belmont High School Performing Arts Company on Saturday, November 20th at 7 p.m. in the Belmont High School Black Box. The play, originally written in Italian by Carlo Goldoni, will use a modern translation by Dorothy Lewis. The Belmont Public Library is hosting a virtual event with author Jeffrey Zenter on Monday, November 19th at 7.30 p.m. Ze Jeff Zenter is the author of New York Times notable book, The Serpent King, Goodbye Days, and Rain and Delia's Midnight Matinee. He also released a new book recently in the wildlife. More information on this event can be found on Belmont Public Library website. What might the near future have in store for us? Having dinosaurs as pets, having 3D takeout dinner, or even being teleported everywhere we go. Join Belmont Books and author Catherine Hulk Gargolinsky as she discusses her new book, Welcome to the Future, with author Amy Joanne Packett on Tuesday, November 30th at 6.30 p.m. This will be held on Zoom. You'll explore different ways technology could alter our way of life. The challenge for you is to decide which changes you want for yourself and the world. There's no place like the home during the holidays. The Belmont Garden Club's design team have decorated nine Belmont homes doors and entryway to create a festive holiday event. Celebrate our town of homes with this fun outdoor event that's taking place on Sunday, December 5th from 12 p.m. onwards. And that's it for this week's edition of Belmont Journal. As a reminder, we have a recess next week. Wishing all of you a very happy and safe Thanksgiving and we'll see you next time.